I believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish His purposes on earth. I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their Savior. I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to people in need. I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God. I believe there is a heaven and a hell, and that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish his eternal kingdom. It is so great to see you here in the North Sanctuary, the South Sanctuary. I just came over and said hello to you, our Speedway campus. I just got word that your whole sound council went all out, so you've been doing a nice little unexpected acoustic worship today. I hope you enjoyed that. We're trying something to get you the message live. I know God's got something special for you. And always a shout out to those who watch online uh, from all over the world. And today we don't want to do a shout out uh, to Desiree, who's watching right here in Kansas City, Kansas. Let's give it up for Desiree and for all those that are joining us online. We love having you, Desiree, and hope our service is encouraging to you. Now, the first order of business is if you brought your Believe Book, you're a Westsider, and you brought your Believe Book or a Bible, hold it up high over your head. We're going to do this every week, like forever. So I'm going to check it out. That's good. Uh, For those of you who are uh, new, we're so glad to have you with us. What's this all about? Well, we're on an epic journey to discover what we believe and why it matters. We are on an epic journey for people who call Westside home to be able to finally articulate with their mouth what they believe and why it matters. Not just to know it, but to be able to give an answer to somebody who asks them, what is this hope that you have within you? And so we've been inviting you to memorize these key ideas and scriptures that unlock the answers to these very key questions. Now, it's important to know, maybe you didn't see this, that the first five that we have covered, the first five key beliefs, these beliefs help us to establish and strengthen our relationship with God vertically. And we know from the teaching of Scripture, when you get that relationship right, everything else will fall into place. And that's why we covered those first. Last week, we turned a corner And we are now focusing on the five key beliefs that will establish and strengthen our relationship with each other, our horizontal relationships. And so that's where we're at. Now, what I want to do is uh, rehearse the first five. We'll just do the key ideas today. And, uh, and for those of you who are our guests today, we'd love for you to join us in this journey. It's not too late. Okay, are you ready, church? All right, here we go. We got one ready, really ready. Back down on the caffeine, dude. Back down on the caffeine. (laughs) Just kidding. I appreciate your enthusiasm. Here we go. If someone were to ask you the question, who is God, what would you say? Ready? I believe the God of the Bible is the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If a person says, but does he care for me, what would you say? I believe God is involved in and cares about my daily life. Way to go, church. What if the person then said, but can I have a relationship? How do I have a relationship with him? What would you say? I believe a person comes into a right relationship with God by God's grace through faith in in Jesus Christ. Way to go. Then the person asks, how do I know this God and his will for my life? What would you say? I believe the Bible is the inspired word of God that guides my beliefs and actions. And then the person asks this important question, who am I? What would you say? I am significant because of my position as a child of God. Then we turn the corner to our horizontal relationships and we ask this key question, how will God accomplish his purposes on earth? We talked about it last week. Do you know it? Say it with me. I believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth. I am so very proud of you. Today, we take a look behind door number six, but it is locked. And so we have to unlock this door to get to a truth that promises to change our life to a belief. In order to unlock this door, you have to answer this key question. Here it is. How does God see us. How does God see us? Are you interested in the answer, church? All right, let's pray, and then we'll get to work. Father, we thank you for 
your word today. It is going to shower us with truth and mercy and love and grace. And I pray that everyone that is hearing my words, whether here right before me or watching somewhere around the world, would receive your truth today, would receive your mercy and grace today, and that it would provide a sense of encouragement and hope. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And all the church said, Once there was a boy who lived in the country. For facilities, they had to use an outhouse. And the little boy hated the outhouse because it was hot in the summer, cold in the winter, and it stank all the time. And this outhouse uh, sat on the bank of a creek, and the boy determined that one day he was going to push this outhouse into the creek. Well, the spring rains came and the creek was swollen, so the little boy decided that today was the day. He grabs a big stick and he pushes and he pushes and he pushes, and finally the outhouse topples into the creek and floats down the creek. At dinner at night, the father said, uh, son, after dinner, I want you to meet me at the woodshed. Knowing that this meant he was going to get a spanking, the boy asked why. Well, the father said, someone pushed the outhouse into the creek today. It was you, wasn't it, son? And he said, yes. Then the boy responded, but dad, today I read at school that George Washington cut down a cherry tree and he didn't get into trouble because he told the truth. <laughs> to which the father said, yes, but George Washington's dad wasn't in that cherry tree. <laughs> It is in our nature to get even, to get angry. It's in our nature to connive and to correct. It's in our nature to be selfish and to be haughty. It's in our nature to blame and to shame. It is in our nature to go secret and to go dark, and the list goes on. It's in our nature, and we offer this all up at the expense of others, including those fathers who frequent the outhouse. You know, we sometimes make it very difficult for people to love us. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 5 says, but God. Anytime you read in the Bible the words, but God, something awesome is about to come. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, while we were still in the state of being unlovable, God sent his son to die for us. You see, God has a different way of seeing us. It's amazing if you read the Bible from cover to cover, the wording of our key idea really does, in fact, sum up how God sees us. I'm going to put it on the screen, invite you to say it with me, and at the end of the service, we're going to do it from memory. Ready? Say it out loud with me. I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their Savior. And let's not make this any harder than it needs to be. The key passage of Scripture is one most of you know. I've teed it up for you. I've tossed you an easy one this week. Right? You can thank me later. John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's say it out loud together. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. Yes. It depends what translation you memorized it in. Let's take the key idea and divide it into two parts and allow us to open up the Bible and dig deeper into it. The first part goes like this. I believe all people are loved by God. I mentioned to you a few uh, weeks ago about a renowned sociologist by the name of Rodney Stark who did a sociological historical study on the rise of Christianity in the first three centuries. He was mesmerized, even though he wasn't a believer at the time he did the research, at how Christianity overtook the Western world in just three short centuries. 
During the time when the church comes on the scene in the Roman world and the Western world, um, paganism, which is the worship of the Greek mythological gods, is the dominant religion of the day. They've got beautiful buildings. They are funded by the Roman Empire, and they are having a heyday. But um, Rodney Stark says the church comes on board and, and believes something differently than the pagans do, and it was a part of the reason why that Christianity grew and overtook paganism. Uh, pagans used to worship gods, the gods, in an effort to appease the gods so that they would not pick on them. The gods did not love them, but rather the gods were selfish, and you as a pagan would worship these pagan gods in an attempt to uh, keep the gods from picking on you so they might pick on your neighbor instead. But then God comes along, Jesus comes along, and says that's not why we worship God. We worship the one true God because he first loved us. And Rodney Stark said this simple idea that God loves you was one of the primary beliefs that turned the uh, the movement of Christianity into a, a, to a, a tsunami and ultimately pushed the pagans out from the urban centers into the rural areas after three centuries. As a matter of fact, Rodney Stark tells us that the name pagan actually means rural, that pagans were not called pagans until the Christians moved them out of the urban centers into the rural community because the belief that God loves you is a much more compelling reason to worship a God than to appease them. Would you not agree? You may uh, take a look at John chapter 3 and verse 16 and notice it says, God so loved the world. And then it goes on later to say that whoever believes, whoever believes. You may not see yourself as a somebody, although you are. We taught that just a couple of weeks ago. In Christ, you are a somebody. Maybe you still don't see yourself as a somebody, but will you be willing to raise your hand and say, I am one of the whoever's? Anybody would say you're a whoever? Why, of course you are or whoever. So this is the first principle I want you to write down. You are a whoever. So is everyone else. As a matter of fact, if you just take John's gospel, matter of fact, if you have your Believe book, turn to page 121, all the way through page 123, and what I did is I cited all of the times just in the gospel of John where John uses the word all or everyone or whoever, and it just goes on and on and on as John lays out over and over again the the desire of God that all would come to know him, that whoever is willing and to, to receive uh, can come into the kingdom of God. And he goes over and over it again, and his goal is for you to say, okay, stop it, John. I get it. God so loves us, and everybody, every single person is included in his invitation. Now, I have discovered that there are two tendencies amongst most people Tell me which one is most like you. Some people can see how God loves others, but struggles to see how God can love them. Other people see how God can love them, but struggles to see how God can love you. Which one best describes who you are? Do you understand the claim the scripture is making on the character of God? Do you understand the extent of his love, how far that it reaches, and do you believe it? And why is it important? I want you to write down this second principle. Uh, we need to see people the way God sees them. We need to see people the way God sees them. Uh, John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John chapter 3 and verse 16, but he's going to take this concept of John 3, 16 uh, to a whole other level uh, in a book that bears his name as well. Matter of fact, he has three more, uh, the book of John, then he has 1 John, 
Second John, can anybody guess what the last one's called? Third John, they, he needed a marketing person to help him with his titles, uh, but pretty powerful stuff, right? In the book of First John, he takes John chapter three, verse 16 to a whole nother level. Take a look at First uh, John chapter four and verse one. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. James, the half-brother of Jesus, in his book that bears his name, James chapter 3 and verse 9, says this. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. James is saying, if we curse or wish ill on any human, it is a personal insult to God himself who created them. Or another way of putting it, it cancels out your worship on Sunday if you disc his creation on Monday. You understand what we're saying? So be careful, church. In your Believe book on pages 125 and 126 is a beautiful story of a man named Onesimus. Onesimus. Uh, it is a, a book that uh, is called Philemon because uh, Onesimus is a slave and his master, uh, Philemon, is living in the city of Colossae. And what we learn in the story is Onesimus flees from his master, Philemon. Uh, maybe he stole something, and, uh, but we know for sure that he splits. Uh, and through a divine appointment, Onesimus meets up with the apostle Paul in the city of Rome, where Paul is under house arrest, and the apostle Paul leads Onesimus, the slave, to Christ. Now, Onesimus is being sent back home at the instruction of Paul to Colossae to have a meeting with Philemon, his master. You can feel the tension. But Paul sends a personal written hand letter with Onesimus to give to Philemon, before Philemon responds or reacts. It's found on page 125 of your Believe book or the book of Philemon, just 25 verses, about halfway down. Let me begin right here. It says, uh, Paul writes, I am sending him, Onesimus, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you uh, for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Now here's why I want you to listen. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. He goes on to write, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. You know, Paul led Philemon to the Lord, and he's saying, you owe me a solid, dude. I led you to the Lord. Now you have eternal life. This is the least you can do for me, dude, in case you're thinking of hedging on this bet. <laughs> I love Paul. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Then he calls him up to the next level. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. What a powerful idea that a slave would go back home to his master and the master would no longer look at him as a slave, but rather would look at him as a fellow man and a brother in Christ. There is no difference between them, Paul says. And this is the call of God on our lives today. 
Paul puts it clear in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 29. He says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all, say it with me, church, one in Christ Jesus. In our day, we might say, for the Christian, there is no black or white, there is no rich or poor, there is no man or woman, for we all have equal value at the foot of the cross. And the church said? But we could go on to say, as Christians, that there is no more single or married, young or old, born or unborn, disabled or abled, fat or skinny, sick or healthy, because we are all of equal value at the foot of the cross. And all the church said, amen, amen to that. Now, the second part of our key idea, I believe all people are loved by God. The second part goes, and need Jesus Christ as their savior. I want you to uh, look again at John chapter 3, verse 16, the second part. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, I want you to say this part with you, ready? Shall not perish, but have eternal life. Here's the second principle, next principle I want you to write down, ready? If people don't believe in Jesus, nothing else really matters. If you understood what John was writing, you would automatically believe this. The average life expectancy in the United States is 78.8 years of age. Let me ask you, what is that in the face of eternity? The person who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ is in fact not a child of God and when they die will not spend eternity with God. Let's up it to 500 years. Let's say a person lives for 500 years. I say again, what is that in the face of eternity? If that person in the 500 years never comes to believe in Jesus Christ, to receive the gift of the forgiveness of sin, that person will not spend eternity with God. Paul says, the Bible teaches over and over again, whether it's 78.8 years or 500 years or a million years, it's like a vapor here today and gone tomorrow in the face of eternity. If in fact, in this life, a person doesn't for themselves confess Christ as their savior and receive the forgiveness of sins, nothing else is going to matter. This is very instructive for believers today. If you study the life and pattern of Jesus, you will notice he's very consistent. Jesus never tries to clean up a person on the outside. He never does. Jesus' complete focus with people on the outside was a first focus on them knowing God and the offer of forgiveness through Christ. The only people that Jesus ever challenges were the religious leaders who thought they were on the inside who were getting it wrong. Jesus gets all up into their business. He actually calls them names. We won't talk about that right now. What does this mean to us? It means to us that it is understandable for Christians on the inside to expect a higher standard of fellow Christians. But we need to be very careful not to send a message to the people on the outside that you have to clean up first before you can come in. I want you to write down these two principles. You don't need to clean up to come in. You come in to clean up. You get that, church? It's so important in our witness that we don't expect people outside of Christ to clean up before they come in, they come in, and then the mess of their life, day by day, through the grace of Christ, can get all cleaned up in his timetable. And here's the next principle. Come as you are, knowing that God has no intention of keeping you there. Amen? Now, some of you might hear these words. You're understanding everything. It's certainly not anywhere near as complicated theologically as the message that I gave last week on the church and the body of Christ. But I tell you, the word of God is not Pollyanna, or this is not a preacher coming with a 
hopeless optimism. This, in fact, is the call of God on our life, and it flows out of the fact that God loved us first and sees us this way, and therefore we're called to do the same. I will tell you that everything I've said for the average person, everything I've said, you understand at least 99%. It is you, you, your cognitive of, of what I've said. But I will tell you, of all the beliefs we're going to study, this is one of the hardest to actually believe in your heart, to see yourself and to see other people who may not be lovable in your mind, to see them as God sees them, who completely and so loves them. And I'll have to tell you, I'm not there myself, but I have made it my ambition in Christ to get there. And it's hard, isn't it? But this is what God expects of us. This is what God wants of us. And, uh, and how I've been getting there, uh, little by little, is I have been hanging out with some people that are helping me. I want to uh, introduce you via video to a lady um, that I met in San Antonio. She was a part of the congregation that I pastored there. And her name is Heather Hirschchap. And uh, Heather and I are friends. And uh, we became friends. And... Um, she's helped me to understand this principle in a powerful way. So we did her story uh, through a video, and then after the video, I interviewed her in the church that I served in San Antonio. Uh, so I'd like you just to sit back and uh, let Heather Hirschchap do for you what she has done for me. Gets me just a little bit closer to seeing people the way God does. Take a look. My name is Heather Hirschchap. And I was born with cerebral palsy, which affects my arms and legs, and I can't listen and find motor control. But more importantly, I was born as a child of God, and I believe that each person, no matter what their circumstances, disability, or background, or their Part of God's kingdom, and they're so loved by God. I'm just like you, except that I have caregivers who come in and dress me, dry me, and cook for me. I've owned two degrees, and I've traveled all over the world to start to children of all ages about how special they are and that they're purposeful too. I also want to be married and have a family someday as well as do other many, many things and it'll be exciting to see what God does. Wendy has asked me to give you insight on what to do when you see me or someone like me. Don't be afraid to talk to us, ask questions, but more importantly, love us for who we are, not what we could be or what we were, but who we are in the moment. My name is Heather Hodgson, so loved by God. We are your sons. I want to introduce you to a fellow human being and a sister in Christ. This is Heather Hirschchap. When I first, well, the first few times that I met Heather, I will confess that I underestimated her. After spending some time with her, I discovered that in most circumstances, although you can't see it, Heather is the smartest person in the room. The, the very first time you met me, I bet you that I was a horrible driver because I was in a ditch. 
Yes, you were. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why I underestimated you. She, uh, she carries two degrees, including a master's degree from Baylor Theological Seminary, which means truth. She may know as much or more about the Bible than I do. Not likely, but it's possible. Maybe. Maybe not. We'll discuss it later. We'll discuss it later. That's right. The second thing you need to understand is that Heather is likely the most disciplined person in the room. What it takes Heather to get here on a Sunday is more than it takes us. Do you know that today there are people who are not here because it's raining? (laughs) The amount of energy that it takes Heather to get ready to be here is a commitment. But not only that, the amount of extra energy and discipline for her to get an undergraduate and a graduate degree from a leading university, 40-page papers after 40-page papers, is a difficult time. Sometimes 50. (laughs) And some of you are saying, wait a minute, I don't have a master's degree. That's my point. You don't, and she does. I'm bragging on you now, sister. Yep, you need (laughs) stuff. I've also discovered in getting to know the person is that Heather is not a whiner. She's not a whiner. Do you know that? Yeah, what's that? She's not my caregiver. Yes, yeah. She does have some care. Now, I want you to know that uh, most of the time I see Heather, she has a pillow here. I want you to know that this is not a fashion statement. Not usually. Not usually. Today, though, you did match it's it up nice. It's very corny. Yeah, it's very corny. Because she knew she was going to be sitting in front of you today, yeah. right? She has this pillow because she lives with chronic pain. And the pillow provides her relief. Just a little bit. Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> God is supposed to do that. That's yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Maybe she does know more about the Bible than me. She um, is not a freeloader. She works for an organization called Faith Ability. She lives independent from her parents. Heather, if you get to know her, you'll discover she has the same longings that you do. Longings to belong and longings to be used deeply by God. Every day. Every day. One day, Jesus Christ is going to fulfill his promise to Heather and give her a new body, free from a wheelchair, and then it will be easier for us to see Heather the way Heather and God sees her. But until then, we are called by God to see Heather as God sees her. I'm looking forward to playing on the monkey bars. She's looking forward to playing on the monkey bars. Yeah. <laughs> it would seem appropriate that this would be the moment in the service that we prayed for Heather. But I think in this moment, it would actually be better if Heather prayed for us. So if you're willing to receive the prayer from our sister, Heather Hurstchap, I'm going to invite you to hold out your hands in the position of receiving her words to God on our behalf. Would you pray for us? Yes, I would love to. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are all created in your image with our own gifts, talents, and abilities. The world might see our many, many, many flaws and discouragements and disabilities of all sorts, but you see the hurt. You touch a hurt. You give us reason and purpose to live and love abundantly through your only Son, Jesus Christ. It is in his name I pray. Amen. Let's give it up for your sister, my sister, Heather Hirsch. (laughs) 
So a little update on Heather. Uh, she is now married and has a child. Did you see this? She says, we're going to see what God is up to. At one time, Heather said to me, uh, I have cerebral palsy. What's your problem? <laughs> I think Heather's been the best preacher today that we could possibly have. Say it with me. I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their Savior. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this message from Westside Family Church. We're on a journey of discovering how to think, act, and be more like Jesus. If you've been impacted by what God is doing through the Believe journey, we'd love to hear from you. Share your story at westsidefamily.church forward slash we believe. These stories are incredibly encouraging to both our staff and our church family. If you'd like to invest in what God is doing through Westside, you can give online at westsidefamily.church forward slash give. Thank you so much for watching.